So I have an ever-growing list of composers that I privately refer to as rabbit hole composers, meaning that every now and then I'll discover one or two pieces that'll pique my interest, and then I obsessively listen to as much of that composer's work as I can. This list includes people such as Aaron Copeland, Christopher Rouse, Igor Stravinsky, John Adams, Maurice Ravel, Richard Strauss, and many, many others. Now today I'm going to talk about the most recent addition to that list, the French composer Olivier Messiaen. So Messiaen was born December 10, 1908 in Avignon, France, to a poet mother and an English scholar father. He displayed his musical talent at an early age, teaching himself piano while his father fought in the First World War. After the war, his father took a teaching job in Paris, and Messiaen became a pupil of the Paris Conservatory, where he studied under the likes of Maurice Emmanuel and Paul Ducat. It was here that Messiaen began to take interest in some of the then-recent great French composers such as Ravel and Debussy, and you can easily hear their influence on Messiaen's music in one of his first published works, The Eight Preludes for Piano, written in 1929. Interestingly enough, the Eight Preludes also brings us to another important part of Messiaen's music, color. Now I don't mean color as it relates to orchestration and timbre, or even harmonic color, although all of this exists in abundance in Messiaen's entire output. Rather, I mean perceived color. Messiaen experienced a neurological condition called synesthesia, which causes the brain to involuntarily associate certain stimuli with unrelated sensory sensations. A common version of synesthesia is associating colors with certain auditory sensations, basically seeing sounds. Messiaen had this very permutation of synesthesia and associated certain notes and combinations of notes with certain colors. In fact, Messiaen includes a note describing the color of each of the preludes. The first, for example, is described as orange with violet veins. It is incredibly easy to hear this use of color in several of Messiaen's major works, especially in pieces such as his massive Tarangalila symphony, which frequently juxtaposes a wide variety of different textures and harmonies. In 1931, Messiaen was appointed as the organist at the Église de la Sainte Trinité in Paris, succeeding the late Charles Cuff. Messiaen was already an accomplished organist, winning numerous competitions in organ improvisation at the Paris Conservatory, as well as writing several compositions for the instrument, although most organ works from this period are either lost or unpublished. Messiaen held this position for the rest of his life and used it as a means to write several great organ works, including the Livre d'Algues, which has been compared to Bach's well-tempered clavier. Another example of these works was written just a year after his appointment, the Apparition de l'Église Éternelle, which was in fact premiered at the Église de la Sainte Trinité in 1932.
Apparition brings us to one of the most important themes that occurs in almost all of Messiaen's work, religion and faith. Messiaen was raised a devout Catholic and remained so for his entire life, and in fact, most of every one of Messiaen's major works relates in some way or another to his unique, highly mystic sense of faith. Just like with his music's synesthetic qualities, it is also easy to hear the great profundity and vast expanse of the divine in all of Messiaen's work. Sidetrack. Did you catch that weird, otherworldly sound when we took a glimpse at the Tarangalila Symphony? That sound is coming from what I imagine is one of Messiaen's and, let's be honest, my favorite instruments, the Onde Martino, which is essentially a keyboard that sounds like a theremin. Messiaen features the instrument along with the piano as a soloist throughout the symphony and uses it in several other works. However, I think that the coolest example of Messiaen's use of the instrument is in his first piece using it, Fête de Belzol, written for the 1937 Paris Exhibition. It's a half-hour romp for six of these instruments, originally intended to accompany moving fountains that were on display at the exhibition. Anyway, let's get back on track. One of Messiaen's most famous works comes from one of the 20th century's darkest periods. After the start of the Second World War, Messiaen was drafted, but, due to poor eyesight, was enlisted as a nurse. In 1940, he was captured by German forces and taken to Stalag 7A, a prisoner of war camp outside of Gerlitz, Germany. Basically, a toned-down concentration camp. It was here that Messiaen met three other musicians, violinist Jean Le Boulard, cellist Etienne Pasquier, and clarinetist Henri Coca. The four musicians were given preferential treatment as artists, for example, assigned kitchen work rather than mining labor, and the other prisoners were able to collect enough money to buy instruments for the musicians. The quartet performed regularly for the entertainment of prisoners and guards alike, and there was even a guard at the camp, Carl Albert Bruhl, who recognized and admired Messiaen and managed to procure manuscript paper for the composer and ensured that he received time in isolation to study and compose. The result of these circumstances is well known. Messiaen wrote a series of pieces for those three musicians as well as himself and later adapted them into the Cato pour le fin de temps, the quartet for the end of time. The piece was first performed on December 15, 1941, while Messiaen was still imprisoned at Stalag 7A. The audience was made entirely of prisoners and guards, and Messiaen himself has said in reference to this specific performance that never was I listened to with such rapt attention and comprehension. Soon after this performance, Bruhl managed to forge an official document to free Messiaen and his fellow musicians. This work contains just about every compositional device that Messiaen uses. There is harmonic stasis, where a series of chords do not resolve but endlessly repeat, creating a static, meditative state. Modes of limited transposition, which are scales that, when transposed by certain intervals, yield the same set of pitches, such as whole tone or octatonic scales. Use of rhythm as duration, not meter. Using time signature only as a means of organization, or, as in this example, not using time signature at all. Cator pour le fond de temps also marks the beginning of one compositional trademark that is often an identifying detail in Messiaen's music, birdsong. Messiaen loved birds and often ventured out into nature to study them as well as translate their chirps into musical notation. 
He believed that birds were the divine songsters, representing all of the beauty as well as all of the chaos that can be found in nature given to man by God. In short, bird is the word. However, while the quartet does use birdsong, it is to a very limited extent, and Messiaen would not write a piece centered solely around birdsong until 1953, with his work for solo piano and orchestra, Réveil des Oiseaux. So now we've more or less laid out the basics of Messiaen's compositional style, as well as some of the influences and philosophical cornerstones of his work. But we still have a ways to go. After all, the guy died in 1992, and we just heard a piece from almost 40 years earlier. Here are a few other important pieces from the second half of Messiaen's life. The first is tied for the position of my favorite Messiaen piece, 1960's Chronochromie which is dominated by birdsong, rhythmic complexity, and textures influenced by Balinese gamelan music. Birds aside, this is also one of Messiaen's only secular works. In 1969, we have Messiaen's most ambitious work to date, the Transfiguration de Notre Seigneur Jésus-Christ, a 100-minute odyssey for seven instrumental soloists, a six-part choir, and an orchestra of over a hundred musicians centered around the story of Jesus' transfiguration, a topic that Messiaen had been intrigued by for decades until the opportunity to write a work about it arose with the commission received in 1965. Messiaen was later commissioned to write a work commemorating the United States Bicentennial, and, rather than setting the Revolutionary War or any associated writings by the Founding Fathers to music, Messiaen responded by traveling to the American Southwest and finding inspiration in landscapes such as the Grand Canyon, Zion National Park, and Bryce Canyon, which he considered to be the most beautiful place on Earth. This resulted in the 1974 work De Canyons aux Etoiles, another grand odyssey, this time traveling from the grand landscapes of the earth to the vast expanses of paradise, with, of course, a few birds along the way. Nearly a decade later, we have what has been considered Messiaen's magnum opus, his one and only stage work in the form of a three-act, five-hour opera, Saint-François d'Assise. I'll give you three guesses what it's about. Despite its length, this massive work has none of the spectacle or melodrama of Messiaen's predecessors in French grand opera, but still radiates a grandness in its sheer scale. It also doesn't have a clear plot line either, focusing less on the story of St. Francis, but the importance of his story and teachings, with texts drawn from St. Francis' own teachings, as well as those of Franciscan friars from throughout history. This work is not often performed, as it includes nine principal singers, a mixed choir of 150, and a pit orchestra of over 110 musicians, including not one, not two, but three on Martineau's. Hit me up if any of y'all want to mount a performance. Messiaen died on April 27, 1992, at the age of 83 due to surgical complications, and the world mourned the loss of one of the defining musical voices of the century. However, the world had yet to hear the last of Olivier Messiaen. He left behind a well-developed but unorchestrated manuscript of a concerto for flute, oboe, cello, and piano, written for and dedicated to flautist Catherine Quentin, oboist Heinz Holger, cellist Mstislav Rostropovich, 
pianist and wife Yvonne Loriot, and conductor and former student Myungwon Chung. Quentin, Holliger, and Rostropovich had been asking Messiaen for a concerto for the better part of 20 years, and many of his piano works are dedicated to Loriot. The work was written as an homage to the concerti of Mozart, Scarlatti, and Rameau, using several formal idioms that these composers often turn to, such as Ritornello and Rondo. The dedicatees collaborated continuously to orchestrate Messiaen's original sketches, and the Concert Quatre was premiered in 1994, two years after the composer's death. Again, if any all flautists, cellists, or pianists want to mount a performance, hit me up. Knowing all of this, it's easy to see why he's often considered to be one of the truly original voices of the 20th century. I mean, think about it. Can you think of any instance where Messiaen sounds like any other composer? And, for that matter, can you think of any instance where any other composer sounds like Messiaen? The answer? If you can, it's rare. This is for two major reasons. First, Messiaen never actively took part in serialism or any other similar compositional fads, and even when he came close it was through ideas like modes of limited transposition or rhythmic modes. And second, although Messiaen taught composition for his entire career, and even turned out some pretty notable students such as Karlheinz Stockhausen, Iannis Sinakis, and Pierre Boulez, he never forced his own musical language or style on any of his students. And I challenge you to find anything in common between, say, an excerpt from Messiaen Saint-Francois and Boulez's Le Marteau sans Maître. Okay then, let's get weirder. What about Messiaen's Des Canyons aux Etoiles and Xenakis's Prithoprocta? Okay, you asked for it. Let's try Messiaen's Chronochromie and Starkhausen's Contact. I can tell from the pained expression on all your faces that you've had enough, but my point still stands. Olivier Messiaen was one of the truly original musical voices of the 20th century, and is still regarded as such. Thank you all for sitting through all of this information, as well as my shoddy at best French. Messiaen is the kind of composer that people will write full-fledged dissertations on single pieces, so it's a lot of material to discuss in such a short time. As a reward for your patience, we'll finish this spiel with a partial performance. The piece that Chromochromie is tied with for my favorite Messiaen piece is his pseudo-concerto for piano, winds, and percussion titled Oiseau Exotique, Exotic Birds. Messiaen studied recordings of birds from throughout Asia as well as North and South America and compiled them into this bubbly and eccentric masterwork. So, here's me, playing the first of five bird song cadenzas in Olivier Messiaen's Oiseau Exotique, Enjoy.
it grew out of the idea of the theremin. You know that woo, yeah. that kind of spooky sound.